Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to our forum featuring candidates for the Kansas House of Representatives 48th District. My name is Reggie Kusmani. I'm the Director of Government Affairs for the University of Kansas Health System, and I am a member of the Overland Park Chamber's Public Policy and Advocacy Committee. Uh, I'd like to thank the audience today for coming, and we appreciate your time and willingness to be here. The Johnson County Public Policy is a collaborate, or sorry, Public Policy Council is a collaborative effort to of the ten, ten chambers of commerce that represent more than 5,000 Johnson County businesses. In addition to hosting forums such as this, the Public Policy Council conducts other voter education efforts, which includes the publishing of a wealth of candidate information on the council's website, which is www.votejoco.com. Terry Frederick, and last time I did this, I um, did not introduce them, but most of them introduced themselves in their opening statements. I'm just gonna take a few seconds to introduce both of you to the audience. Terry Frederick is an Overland Park CPA and tax professional who worked for a large Kansas City-based corporation before launching his own small business. He was elected um, to the Water One Board of Directors where he served three terms as a chair, and he is active in numerous community organizations including the Lions Club and is a leadership of Northeast Johnson County graduate. Dan Osmond is an Overland Park attorney who was elected to represent the residents of the 48th House District when his predecessor resigned the seat in 2021. He previously was elected to the Hickman Mills School Board, and outside of work and serving in the legislature, Dan is involved with several community organizations and serves as president of his homeowners association. So today's format, each candidate will have two minutes for an opening statement, then after opening comments, we'll rotate through questions written by the Public Policy Council, and we will get through as many questions as time allows. Candidates will have two minutes each to answer the questions, and we will not be taking questions from the audience today. Because this is a forum and not a debate, we have not built in time for rebuttal. And at the conclusion of our Q&A period, we will give each candidate one minute for closing remarks. Prior to the forum, we drew numbers to determine who would speak first. And based on that random drawing, we will begin with Terry Frederick and his opening statement. Terry, welcome, and we will give you two minutes for your opening statement. Well, thank you, and thank you to the Public Policy Council and the Overland Park Chamber for hosting the event. I appreciate the opportunity to talk about some of the issues that are coming up in this election and um, being able to speak to the residents of House 48. My name is Terry Frederick. I am running for Kansas House 48. Um, I, a little bit of background, I've been married for 34 years to my wife, Karen. I have three boys. The oldest one just graduated from college. I have two that are within a couple of years of graduating, so um, getting very close to being tuition free. Um, I've lived in Johnson County for most of my life. Um, as Reagan said, I'm a certified public accountant. I've spent my career doing tax policy, helping businesses and families um, with their um, tax issues. Um, I did 26 years at Sprint, and the last six years I've been with my own firm doing taxes for businesses and families. Um, serving the community has always been very important to me. Um, I served on the board of Water One for 24 years, including six years as chairman. Um, and I'm a member of the Lions Club. I'm also an adult leader in Boy Scouts, um, including um, 17 years, including about 10 years as committee chair. The uh, proudest thing is I have three Eagle Scouts for my, with my sons. In all the roles that I've served, I've used my background to help get things done for the community. Um, I get along with people. Um, I'm able to move things forward to get things done. Um, now's the right time for me to run. Um, I, um, the boys are out of the house, um, and I have my own firm, so I have the time to spend to get it done. When I was at Sprint, I did not. I mean, times are tough with rising costs. Um, as I've been knocking on doors, I've heard of a lot of the struggles, and I know we'll have time like, during the, the questions to talk about some of the things I think that the legislature can do to um, help our neighbors as, as they're struggling. Thank you. Thank you, Terry. Same for you, Dan. Two minutes. All right, thank you. Hello, my name is Dan Osman. I'm the current representative for District 48, um, and I'm an attorney and a small business owner, and also a member of the Overland Park Chamber of Commerce. I joined that before I even uh, came onto the legislature because I really wanted to know what was happening at Overland Park 
and what was the community feeling at that time um, so that I could continually stay in touch with, with what is happening here where I live and where my family lives. Um, uh, I spent six years on a school board and so for me education is, is a particular passion and one of um, my, my concerns, one of my supports is being able to make sure that we have fully funded education in the state of Kansas that we're supporting it. Um, I uh, also, I, so I've got a home here with my wife, my two daughters, they attend public school. Um, my wife and I really enjoy our time here. Um, I really just want to make sure. I, it took me a while to sort of figure out exactly where my focus needed to be because talking with so many different people, it was a question of what we needed to do in Overland Park. And I think the biggest issue is we need members of the, the, the legislature that are in tune with what's happening in Overland Park and support Overland Park and are not voting against the interests of what is happening here in Johnson County. Uh, and surprisingly, that happens quite a bit. You will know that when I am up there representing you in Topeka, I am looking for what's best for our neighborhoods and what's best for our district. Thank you. Thank you. So we will go to our first question, and we'll start with you, Dan. As a candidate, what are your top three policy issues? Thank you. Um, so the first one, obviously, uh, right off the bat, is education. As I said uh, before, you know, spending six years on a school board, I really want to make sure that um, that we have a prime educational um, facility here, you know, within uh, Overland Park as well as within the state of Kansas. The fact of the matter is that, that, that education itself is the lifeblood of the community. And it is the reason that people move here, it's the reason that businesses move here, and if we are not continuing to support it, um, that community starts to falter, and that is not what I want to do. The second thing is just economic growth, and that ties in with, with education itself. We need to make sure that we're building um, economic activity and we're building um, ability for our community to continue to grow and to thrive. And that does mean bringing in additional businesses, and that does mean working with those businesses so that, um, so that we have uh, more resources available in, uh, within our community. And the third one is health care. Um, expanding Medicaid is an absolute priority for the state of Kansas as a whole. Um, I serve on the insurance committee uh, up in Topeka. I hear from people as well on uh, insurance related issues, on uh, drug related issues, cost of, um, cost of drug prices, cost of medical care, and I want to make sure that we can solve it. Expanding Medicaid is just one very important step, but one small step in, in that fight. Thank you. Terry, same questions for you. Um, three items. First one is public schools. I know we need to continue to fully support public schools with funding and provide the resources they need. I'm a proud product of Johnson County Public Schools. Um, I grew up here. I know the value not only to our children and grandchildren, but also I think, to our business community. I think we need to have well-educated students to become part of the workforce, and we need to work to keep them here once they do graduate. Um, it's been a problem with uh, children, uh, young adults, moving out, out of the um, area once they graduate. Um, second, I'm promoting common sense tax and regulatory policies um, that will help our residents and and we need to find ways to grow business. Um, business is the lifeblood of the community to keep um, people employed and keep taxes being paid to be able to fund the things that need to be funded. And um, so we need to make sure that we're doing things to um, keep business going. Um, I've been endorsed by multiple organizations, including NFIB, which is the organization that um, represents small businesses, uh, uh, KC Biz PAC, which is the Kansas City Chambers um, PAC that um, indoor, or represents larger businesses in the community, not only in Johnson County, but in the Kansas City metro area, and then also by several agribusiness organizations. So the business organizations have looked at what they think I can bring to, um, to the legislature and have endorsed my candidacy. And finally, provide, promoting affordable health care. Um, I think Dan mentioned it. I mean, 
things. I've been knocking on doors. A lot of families are struggling with health care. Um, and it's not just Medicaid expansion. It's saying health care has just gone crazy, and we need to find ways to um, reduce the cost for all the residents of Kansas. And I'm sure we'll have a question on that later on. So I can go in more details then. All right. Thank you. Thank you. We'll go to our next question, and we'll start with you again, Terry. What are your views on state tax policy being as specific as you can? Um, sure. I mean, as a CPA and dealing with tax policy for my entire career, I've seen it from both the business side and from the, the residents and family side. Um, and it does drive behavior. Um, I, I've knocked on a whole lot of doors where people have said, I'm looking at moving out of Johnson County because I can't afford the taxes on the house anymore. Um, a lot of seniors that are on fixed income that are really struggling. So we need to find a way to help manage the tax cost, um, not only income tax, but property tax and sales tax. A few ideas for details. Um, first is the immediate repeal of the sales tax on food. Um, when the legislature passed it last session, and they were still concerned about the revenue coming in and the COVID impact. We've had some more time since then, and um, revenues continue to be strong. So I think we, the legislature needs to go back in January and immediately repeal the sales tax. Um, retirement income. I mean, not many people know that right now, if you work for the state, if you work for a city, if you work for a school district, your retirement income is not, not taxed in Kansas. But if you work for a private company or the federal government or um, have been saving for your retirement through a 401k, that, um, that income is taxed in the state. There's no good tax policy for having um, your revenue, your income from retirement um, taxed differently just because of where it's coming from. Same with Social Security, depending on the, the amount, and that's also taxed. We need to look at all of that. Again, to help the seniors that are struggling, that's one way to help reduce their costs and hopefully keep them in their house and keep them in the neighborhood. We need to, I mean, I mean, for those that have parents that live in the neighborhood, we need to find ways to keep them here. All right. Dan, same question for you. So, this last year we had about, th about a $3.4 billion budget surplus, one of the greatest in the state of Kansas, and it can continue to improve. Um, but, you know, we have the ability to do so much with those funds, including, so as Terry said, um, the repeal of the uh, grocery sales tax is at 6.5%. It is the second highest in the country. I co-sponsored legislation to get it down to 0% in J July of 2022. We had 45 legislators co-sponsor it. It wouldn't even get heard on the House floor. This is one of the examples that I give as far as legislators voting against the interests that of the district that they serve in. This would help so many people. Um, and so I'm interested in making sure that when we get back in in 2023, we reduce it down to zero in 2023. Um, there's other things as well. When we talk about, um, I knock on doors and I talk to people about their property tax valuation. And it is, the appraisals are double digit inflation from the previous year. And that is something that is top of mind for so many people across the political spectrum. Well, we came out with a plan um, just about two weeks ago that we're going to introduce into the legislature um, next year next year. It's a three-part plan that effectively reduces um, the property sales tax, um, the residential sales tax, and other property sales tax um, within the state of Kansas. One of them, for example, is the local ad valorem uh, tax reduction fund. It has not been funded in several years, and we can add in an additional $54 million into that budget. That then reduces the strain on the county levels, and therefore reduces the strain on the individual property owner um, so that they don't have to have um, to kick in those funds itself. These are examples time and time again where the state should be funding this, this stuff and it means that the, that the individuals are kicking in the, the amounts instead. Thank you. Next question, we'll start with you, Dan. What are your views on K-12 education funding and accessibility? I think that it should be funded. How's that for a simple answer? Um, I believe in fully funding 
education. I also believe in fully funding special education. And it was a shame that this year um, we were uh, only able to fully fund special education for 22 minutes. 22 minutes before the, the legislature rolled it back special education funding. Um, and what does that mean? First of all, it means that we are not upholding to our, um, to our constitutional mandates to continue on funding education. But the second thing is this, it means that the individual school districts now need to kick in those funds, just like on the property tax, to, to make up that difference. Um, and again, this is an example of individual legislators voting against the interest of their own district because this will help so many people. Um, I'm endorsed by, uh, by Stand Up Blue Valley, by Game on Kansas Schools, and by the, uh, uh, the, uh, the, the Teachers Union. And, the, and I'm um, really proud of the ability that a number of organizations have seen that uh, what I have done in my history to, to um, affect change within the educational system and what I continue to do within the legislature. So, you know, I'm on board with making sure that we are fully funded and that it, that public schools are accessible to everybody. Thank you. Terry, same question for you. And we talked about this a couple of times, but yeah, we need to continue to fund public schools um, with a renewed focus on academic achievement. Um, and we can fully fund schools, but if the students aren't getting what they need to be successful in their career, their college, their um, technical school, um, then we haven't succeeded. So we need to make sure that as we spend the funds, they're getting the education they need to be successful. Um, ultimately, our responsibility is to the students. Um, but our teachers are like, very, very good in, in Blue Valley. Um, we need to continue to support them, make sure they have the resources that they need to do their job well. But ultimately, we need, we need to make sure the focus is on the students to make sure they're academically prepared um, our local school boards have to deal with many influences, the federal government through their mandates and their um, um, funding which requires them to, um, the funding which requires um, them to follow the federal mandates. The state board of education which has their own rules and regulations and the legislature which funds the schools. So the school boards have a tough job. Um, I know I, many of them on the school board, and I know that it's hard to be a, a, someone on the local school board, but they're the ones that ultimately drive what happens in our schools, and we need to continue to support them. Thank you. So we'll start with you, Terry, on this question. What types of economic development policies do you support to encourage job growth and business expansion in Kansas? I mean, th there's many different programs that the state has to help incent. Um, companies to come to the state, whether it's property tax abatements or with the new apex of legislation for larger companies. Um, all of that is important. Um, we need to make sure that we're doing the things that need to be done to bring business to the community. Um, when I worked at Sprint, I dealt with it from the company side. So I understand what the companies are looking for when they're trying to uh, make decisions on where to locate. Um, and even being on the company side, I mean, understanding that I mean, the, the state and the local jurisdictions are committing incentives to the company, there should be a commitment by the company um, to make sure that they achieve the employment and investment um, amounts that they said that they would put into the project. Um, there should be some type of back-end back -end, um, review, and if they don't meet the criteria, there should be some type of clawback. I mean, with the Apex project, I mean, it's a great project, 4,000 jobs in the county, I think mean, it's very good. I, mean, I probably would have done the incentives a little bit differently. Um, there's no requirement for a number of jobs or investment and no way to um, even let people know how much is being spent and how many jobs are being um, created. So there has to be some type of accountability for companies that do receive the incentives. Dan, same question for you. Sure. Thank you. 
So as an attorney, one of the, one of the primary things that I do is actually work with uh, developers on economic development projects um, and their incentives and the, all the contractual obligations that, it, that go along with it. So I'm very familiar with it and can translate that to what's happening at the, uh, at the state level. Um, with the APEX project in particular, I voted um, in, in favor of it. I thought that it was a strong project that's going to bring in quite a number of companies and jobs to, um, uh, to Kansas. Uh, honestly, what we need is collaboration between the government and the businesses so that, um, so that they're working uh, collectively together. Um, when you have businesses that are um, trying to get incentives and then they, they need some sort of a neutral third party analysis, the government needs to be able to ensure that those, that those numbers make sense um, and that then be able to implement that incentive package so that it actually works. We also need that strong clawbacks to make sure that if they're not adhering to those, um, they don't uh, they don't get the incentives that they're that they're done that they're entitled to. Um, when all of this happens, when this collaboration happens, it benefits everybody in Kansas. When it's not implemented properly, then it's a one-sided deal, and I'm never in favor of that. And so. You know, when I'm looking at what would happen in the state of Kansas, I'm going to pour over the records and make sure that um, that our actual incentive packages work well for everybody within Kansas. Thank you. Next question, we're going to start with you, Dan. And that question is, what would you do to grow and develop the state's workforce? Okay. I mean, the primary aspect of it is education. I mean, education, 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 from the from uh, primary school level up to put through post secondary level. I mean, when we have um, schools that do well, we have families that move here. When we have families that move here, we have businesses that move here. And when we have an educational system that is good for everybody, the can the uh, the individual community continues to grow and thrive. The state itself will also continue to grow and thrive if we actually if, uh, adhere to our um, uh, to the educational standards that we need to. Larger than that, though, I mean, we need to make sure that we do have some workforce development, and particularly as we look at um, within just the post-secondary market of, say, technical colleges, or um, or even at, um, say, a, a, a within labor unions themselves. Not everybody is necessarily cut out for college itself, but they will thrive in other uh, in other industries and other avenues if we give them that opportunity. And the state can help incentivize those programs so that we continue to have people that will build buildings as well as work in those buildings. And I think that all of it together makes for a better Kansas. Thank you. Terry, same question for you. Um, yes, saying with regards to and how they grow to work for saying state has several programs that can help um, providing incentives to companies to help give them the training that, that they need, the kit and the care programs and a couple others. Um, and um, but we also need to, starting in in K through twelve, I mean there's a lot of opportunities for are used to pick up some skills that will help them in their uh, job, whether it's think, right after high school or after college. Um, there's several different programs with the CAPS program, um, and then at JUCO, there's several programs. And we need to work with the business community to find out what the needs are. I think sometimes there's disconnects between the programs that are out there and what the needs are for the business community. So um, whether it's the state or um, the schools themselves, um, or better yet, a, a collaboration of the two to um, determine what is needed and then try to find the training for them. Um, a lot of the local businesses in the, uh, in the state, um, like Black and Beach, um, help with that. I mean, they have several engineering programs in the CAPS area, and my sons, or one of my sons, was involved in the CAPS program at Blue Valley. And I think it was a great experience for them, so we need to continue to do that also. Thank you. Next question, we'll start with you, Terry. What are your views on the state's role with respect to ensuring access and affordability to post-secondary education? I can definitely speak to the affordability piece. I think college right now is just very expensive. Um, 
when I was in school, I, I could pay for a semester of school for $500. Now you can barely pay for a credit hour of, of college for $500. Um, the cost of education has grown much faster than inflation. The state has a role in that. They do provide funding to, um, to um, colleges and universities, and that's not the only solution. Um, and private funds are out there. Um, but we need to look ultimately at the um, underlying cost. Um, the costs have grown faster than inflation, as I mentioned earlier, and it's unsustainable for many um, families to be able to send their kids to college um, unless they can find student loans. And we have found out what happens when a student gets burdened with student loans. It's very hard to dig out from that when you do graduate. So um, the state needs to continue its funding, but um, we also need to look at the underlying cost of, uh, of um, higher education because um, we need to find alternatives um, that can help bring the cost down. Also, looking at technical schools, um, JUCO is a great solution. I think my boys all took classes at JUCO. Um, relatively inexpensive, I think much more inexpensive than Kansas or Kansas State. And it's a good way to at least get a head start before you start paying three or four or five hundred dollars per credit hour at the university. Thank you. Dan, same question for you. Okay. So post-secondary education is just as important as primary education, and we need to ensure that it's, it's available and accessible to all Kansans. Um, that basically means fully funding uh, it year over year in our budget, and it means that we can take some of our budget surplus, and we have a budget surplus projected for this year of $500 million, um, carve out areas for things like tuition re reimbursement programs, for scholarship opportunities, um, or even additional training programs. Uh, like last year, the governor signed into law the Kansas Promise uh, a Scholarship. Um, and this is an educational opportunity within the individual um, junior colleges or community colleges that allow for VOTEC and other training programs that you can then get reimbursement on your uh, on, on your uh, on your tuition for by uh, by going through this program and uh, and then working out in the field um, this is something I'd love to be able to expand again we have the funds to be able to do so and so it's just a matter of you know making smart decisions with our money now that we have the money to make decisions on and and focusing in on education is a top concern for my, for me. Thank you. We go to our next question, and we'll start with you, Dan. What do you believe the takeaways for state lawmakers should be from the COVID nineteen pandemic experience? Okay, absolutely. Okay, so first and foremost, we should trust the scientific community um, and the recommendations that come from it. We know that masks have helped stop the spread of disease. We know that the vaccines, that when they came out, they lowered the frequency and severity of the infections uh, and severity of the symptoms. And both of those together absolutely saved lives of Kansans. We cannot turn away from the science. And unfortunately, there are a number in the Kansas legislature that believe that we should, um, but we can't. And so, you know, my general takeaway is number one, and trust the science. But I would say on the on the flip side of it, as we ask, what did we learn from it? There's also a question of was the government occasionally too hasty in their policies and too hasty in, in things that they were rolling out, such as shutting down all businesses ended up hurting local businesses. Whereas then if you pick and choose which businesses are open and which businesses are closed, you end up making sure that the large conglomerates can stay in business and can profit. But everybody that, that, is, that brings money into this community um, starts hurting and goes out of business. And that is something that I think we need, if something like this were to happen again, we need to take a more intelligent approach to how um, how we actually roll out um, any modifications or any um, restrictions across the community. Thank you. Same question for you, Terry. Um, I think we learned a lot of things with COVID. I mean, when it first happened, 
and we didn't really know what it was or what the impact was or, or how to deal with it. But over time and relatively quickly, we saw how different states were, were dealing with it. Like Dan mentioned closing businesses. And the governor declared some businesses essential and some non-essential um, and shut down the non-essential businesses. And those non-essential businesses are the livelihoods for not only the owners, but the people that work there. And the right way to look at that should have been, can these businesses operate safely? And if they can operate safely, they should be able to uh, open up or work from home or do different things. Um, to keep the business going, Kansas lost a lot of small businesses because of the governor's decision to deem certain businesses as being non-essential. Um, so that's one of the things we learned. Um, and I think that um, something that hopefully if it happens in the future, we look around to other states. I mean, every state did something a little bit differently. Some of them work better than others and um, look at states where things are successful and, and I, I don't have a problem like, taking the idea from another state if it's gonna be better for our residents and, and businesses. And the other thing we probably learned is on schools. I mean, our school children were hurt uh, dramatically by schools being closed and then being remote again we need to find a way to get the schools to open up as quickly as possible and there's some learning in that but um, we definitely need to needed our kids back in the classroom as quickly as possible because it's going to take a, a long time to catch the students back up to where they would have been if COVID had not have happened thank you next question and we'll start with you Terry for the answer what are your views on health care policy and Medicaid expansion um, I guess I support increasing um, affordable health care to all Kansans. Um, Medicaid expansion is a small subset of that. I mean, there's 150,000 people, I believe, that are would be covered by Medicaid expansion, but there's a lot of families out there that are not insured or underinsured because of the cost. So we need to find ways to reduce the cost for everyone. Um, the legislature has done several things over the last several years to help with that. Um, a couple years ago, they um, made provisions to allow for like, different associations and, and businesses to offer different types of health care that uh, might meet the needs of certain residents and be substantially cheaper than other plans that were available. Um, last year, the legislature um, passed a bill that um, relaxed, relaxed um, regulations on uh, APRNs, advanced practice registered nurses, to allow them to operate more efficiently and effectively. Doing those types of things will lower the cost of, of health care. We need to continue to do that. With regard to Medicaid expansion, um, the way it's currently proposed, I struggle with it. Um, right now, I mean, they're saying about 150,000 people would be covered by it. Of that, almost half of them already have insurance through another so we would be moving 70,000 people from another plan to Medicaid. Medicaid is struggling now. I met with a doctor on Sunday at a driveway event, and they don't even take it. I mean, right now, the federal payments on Medicaid um, causes a lot of practices not to even accept it. So for those that are already in it, if you throw another 150,000 people in it, it will hurt not only their coverage, but also and their care, but the 150,000 people you put into it. Thank you, Dan. Same question for you. Thank you. Kansas is just one of 12 states that have an expanded Medicaid since it was offered back in 2016. We are covered. We're surrounded on all four sides by states that have expanded it. Um, the decision itself has cost our state billions of dollars billions of dollars, hundreds of millions of dollars every single year just for uh, just for not making a quick vote to, to uh, expand Medicaid. Um, beyond the fact that it's denying $150,000, 150,000 of our fellow Kansans access to, uh, to health care. Uh, now, Terry mentioned that maybe 50% of them might already have uh, insurance of some manner or another. I don't know if that's the case, but if that is the case, we still need to, to look out for the other 50%. That is our role in the legislature. Um, honestly, it is 
the, the fact of the matter is that this is a uh, failure of the legislature year over year over year. And there's a growing body of evidence showing that um, it has had ripple effects across a lot of different um, economic uh, sectors because of our inability to expand Medicaid. Um, and when we talk about individual things like uh, actual individual health care costs or, health or prescription drug costs, these sort of things ripple beyond the 150000 to every single Kansan. It increases all of our health care costs because we're not accepting money from the, from the federal government. I will tell you, there is not a single policy decision I, or, or an individual policy decision that I could think of. If somebody were to offer me personally $4 billion, I'd be hard pressed to say of one thing that I wouldn't necessarily vote on for, um, for that. But I can tell you this, if the question is, should you insure and help Kansans, it's a no-brainer. We're voting for it. Next question. How control over decision making is divided among the state legislature and local governments, including school boards? These issues such as taxation, economic development, and education have been a matter of debate. What are your views on this issue? And we'll start with you, Dan. I believe in local control. I believe that we can't really micromanage. Um, honestly, there are too many statewide issues that we are dealing with in the legislature that need to be dealt with. And if we continue to micromanage at, say, the, um, the school board level, the individual school board level, or the state school board level, or if we try to take control over from the governor and, her, and agencies that, um, that, that, that the governor has appointed, if we try to look at what's going on in the federal government, there are so many different things that we could be doing, but our focus needs to be at the state level. Um, so I do believe that there's collaborative approaches that we can take. We should be talking with uh, Johnson County Commissioners. We should be talking with the individual school boards of the districts that we represent. But the fact of the matter is, they're the experts within their field. Let them do their work. Let us do our work up at the state level. Same question for you, Terry. Um, having served on the board of Water One for so long, I understand the importance of local control. I mean, as a board member, you know what the day-to-day -day, day -day issues are and what needs to be done, so it's important to be able to do that. And the state does have a role, though. I mean, they're funding a lot of the organizations, um, so they need to make sure that there's transparency. I mean, they need to um, make sure that they're getting value for the dollars they're sending to the local jurisdictions and, and that's how they would make their decisions is based on the value that they're getting. Um, federal government also is, it wasn't mentioned in the question, but and the problems, I mean, whenever you take money from someone else, there's always strings attached and you've got to deal with that and figure out how is that going to impact local control and whether it's for schools or Medicaid, um, when you do accept the federal dollars or strings attached, which creates Problem. So sometimes it might be better to um, work around and find a different way to um, fund the schools or um, for the insurance for the folks that don't have insurance. Um, find another way to do it without taking the federal dollars where you have many strings attached that not only impact that um, 150,000 people but, um, but um, many other programs within the state. Thank you. We're at our last question now, and we'll start with you, Terry. What do you believe most distinguishes you from your opponent in this race? Um, three things I thought of to talk about is one, serving the community for nearly 24 years on the Board of Water One. I, I understand the importance of local government, but we talked about it in the last question. And, and whether it's a water utility um, with an elected board or the county commission or the school board, um, those people are put in place to do their job also, and we need to work with them. I mean, whether it's a collaboration with them or um, in certain cases they have total control and we need to make sure that happens. Um, second, as a CPA, I've lived my life um, dealing with tax policy. 
both seeing how it impacts businesses, like how it impacts families, how it impacts local governments. Um, and I think that I can take that um, knowledge up to Topeka and do good for the residents of, of the district and, and be their voice. Um, whether it's businesses that are struggling because of tax policy or like, families that are struggling with tax policies. And finally, I have the ability to get things done, to make them work with both sides of the aisle. Um, my opponent has not been successful moving many of the ideas forward that he tried to last session. Um, excuse me. Um, our uh, district has been served by three different Democrats in the last three years. And so it's a four year term, but over the last three years, we've had three different Democrats that they have or two that have resigned and then two that have been appointed. So we need someone that's willing to be there for a long period of time and, and serve the residents because getting to know the legislators and being able to work with them is very important and when you rotate through um, representatives like the Democrats have done over the last three years, I mean, that doesn't help the process. All right, thank you. Same question for you, Dan. I would say one word, endorsements. Break it down into uh, in the individual components, um, and we can talk about that. The endorsement process itself is, you know, as a neutral or a third party making a determination of how candidates are different from one another. So let's look at my endorsements. Education. I have uh, the KNEA, Game on Kansas Schools, and Stand Up Blue Valley. All three of them said your record, your record stands for itself, and they believe that I'm the right choice in terms of how we should um, how we should we should move forward with education for the state of Kansas. Part two is um, the Casey Bizpack and the Mainstream Coalition. So, Casey Bizpack is is an arm of the uh, Kansas City Chamber of Commerce. They um, believe that I'm, uh, that I'm strong on business. And the Mainstream Coalition is an organization that is designed for two goals. One is, um, as a bipartisan organization, to, uh, to promote things that are happening in Johnson County and to fight extremism. And this is not an issue where, um, you can, where they have to select one person or the, uh, over the other. Both of us could have been endorsed, only one person uh, was endorsed in this in this election myself and the third one um, is an endorsement I do not have Kansans for life we had the amendment last uh, that was uh, that was voted on in August 2nd 67.4% of my district said no to the amendment no uh, to govern over government regulation and no to making sure that women don't have access to the health care and their own decisions over their own body. So those are the three reasons why uh, I think that I'm uh, different than my element. Thank you. I'd like to thank you both for your time and for sharing your comments with us and covering the important issues that we did today. We're now going to turn to our closing comments and you will each again have one minute for this one um, and we will start with Dan. Okay. Uh, so I'll just talk about my general philosophy. As I said, um, I really try to make sure that I'm representing what is happening here in Overland Park and what's happening in my district, and I would vote on what's happening within my district. Uh, and the read that I do that is I have weekly legislative updates during the legislative session to make sure that people are informed about what's going on up in Topeka. And I hold monthly town hall meetings every single month to, um, so that anybody, regardless of party, regardless of ideology, can come to it, talk to me about what their concerns are, and I can better represent them. That is the sort of open communication that I offer and will continue to offer as I, as I go through. Terry had mentioned, you know, that there have been a lot of Democrats that have come through in the last few years. I'll tell you this, my wife and I just refinanced our house. We are not moving anywhere. I would not have, uh, have signed on if I didn't want to 
do a great job and really think that I can make a difference for the long haul for the state of Kansas. So thank you very much. Thank you. Same for you, Terry. One minute. Thank you, and thank you again to the chamber for hosting this event. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to share my views with the residents of the district. I've talked about my background and some of the things I think I can bring to the legislature. I mean, fully funding public schools is very important um, and one of the things that we need to make sure that we do. Um, interestingly, um, the Kansas legislature passed and the governor signed House Bill 2567, which was to fully fund the schools last session. Um, I would have voted for that bill. My opponent voted against fully funding schools in the legislative session. Um, so I mean, we do have differences between what we believe in, and I think that um, as I've knocked on thousands of doors um, and met many families um, that are struggling, I think I can bring um, help to them, and being part of the uh, majority, I think I have the ability to get things done when we get to Topeka. I will work with the Democrats, but being in the majority, you definitely have an advantage to get things done. But thank you again. Uh, more information can be found at terryfrederickforkansas.com. I ask for your vote. Thank you very much. Thank you. First of all, I'd like to thank both of you for coming today and participating in your willingness to serve the people of Kansas. I just wanted to remind everybody that there is a recording of this forum that will be available to you, along with other election-related information. And again, that's at www.joco.com. Sorry, votejoco.com. And just a reminder that in-person voting begins on, uh, advanced in-person voting begins on Saturday, October 22nd, and election day is Tuesday, November 8th. Thank you so much for tuning in, and we look forward to seeing you again.